This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The ninth lecture on gradient echo sequences is divided into four parts. Lecture 9b covers the mathematics of balanced SSFP. The learning objectives are to describe a matrix formulation of the balanced SSFP signal, to describe a geometrical formulation of the signal, and to explain transient signals mathematically. Note that this lecture has most of the mathematics, whereas the previous lecture had more of the intuition behind the steady state. We begin with a matrix derivation of the balanced SSFP signal. The sequence simply alternates between a 60 degree and a minus 60 degree flip angle here, separated by TR, and we're looking at the magnetization immediately after the RF pulse. So we can write the sequence in matrix form uh, by applying first the rotation about negative y of alpha, then we have a rotation of 180 degrees, which corresponds to the alternating sign and allows us to do this over one TR. And then this is followed by relaxation over the TR. And of course, these are applied in reverse order. Now, if we look at the magnetization immediately after the RF pulse, we apply the RF matrix to this 180 degree rotation matrix to the relaxation matrix to itself in the steady state. And then we add the rot rotation due to the RF pulse times the recovery due to relaxation. Notice that we have no MY in this case, and we can write this in matrix form looking like this. With some manipulation, we're able to uh, invert this signal, and the inverted signal can be simplified to the following form. So we leave out the mathematical details. These are not terribly difficult, but we'll take some working out because we've done this inversion analytically. So this brings us to the first. So this brings us to a question. Let's pause here and look at what is the steady state elevation angle. So the question is, what is the angle from the MZ axis of the steady state magnetization? Here is the magnetization expression that we just showed in the previous slide. So in order to calculate the angle, we simply have to look at the last term, which is the vector term. If we make the approximation that E2 is very close to 1, which applies because of the very short TR, we can write this expression as shown here, that tan alpha over 2 is equal to mx over mz. This is a very good sign, because this tells us that the magnetization immediately after the RF pulse is tilted by half of the flip angle, which is what we saw in the previous lecture. So let's look at the next question. What if the E2 is approximately 0, or we have a very short T2? In this case, we have no magnetization at the end of TR. In this case, because E2 is 0, this expression simplifies to the familiar expression that we saw before. In this case, the magnetization is the same as the excitation recovery, where we make the approximation that the signal is 0 at the end of TR. So this is also a very good sign. Now let's take this one step further and consider the matrix derivation of the signal when you include off-resonance precession. So we have the same sequence, but now we would apply the, the same relaxation term, but in this case we'll actually have a precession term indicated by phi. Notice that the rotation of 180 degrees still lets us do the simulation over 1 TR. Now, if you do this analytically, it will take a while. It becomes quite a bit more um, complicated. But there are solutions, and the solution is this 
in this form here. This is the magnetization immediately after the RF pulse, and it can be written as an expression of these terms, indicated by little a, little b, little c, and little d. And these are uh, include the uh, precession angle phi here. So the expressions for the a, b, c, and d are functions of e1 and e2, and the cosine and sine of the flip angle as shown here. So as you can see, this expression is quite a bit longer here. And if we plot this, this gives us a form that we can see that matches what we saw in the previous lecture for the signal. So really, I just want to show you how you can derive this uh, if you needed to, and what this final expression is. So what we've done here is we've derived the signal on resonance, but immediately after the RF pulse. If we want to consider the effect of precession and T2 decay, we should think about the fact that magnetization is refocused midway between the RF pulses at TE equals TR over 2. The magnetization therefore has linear phase at T equals 0 or at TE just before the RF pulse. In addition, there's a small T2 or T2 star decay from the initial RF pulse to the TE. And this would be e to the minus TE over T2 or e to the minus TE over T2 star. So in some ways to calculate the signal right after the RF pulse, we would actually have to back up the signal. This is because remember that the refocusing occurs midway between RF pulses. So we can look at the diagram here and remember that the signal right after the RF pulse is on this elliptical distribution and has this linear phase. Because if you think about it, you can work backwards from the refocus state where the phase is flat, and this therefore gives us a linear phase. So alternatively, we can use the ellipsoid model that we showed in the previous lecture and the geometric approach to calculate the signal. If we start with the ellipsoid, as was shown in the previous lecture, this is determined by the T2 and T1 of the signal. Notice that this is not even a function of the flip angle. So we can write this ellipsoid as shown here. The ellipsoid has a height of m0 and a width of m0 times the square root of t2 over t1. If we substitute mz as m cosine beta over 2 and mxy as m sine of beta over 2, we can write this expression as shown here. Next, we can multiply it out and bring up the t2 over t1. We multiply out the squares, and we bring up the t2 over t1, and we get this expression here, shown in orange. If we divide out the m, we can rearrange and we can multiply by sine of beta over 2. And finally, we can divide out the cosine and sine terms in the numerator and divide these out of the denominator, and we get this relatively simple expression here. So we can make some comments about this. The signal drops with increasing t1 over t2. At an effective flip angle of beta of 180 degrees, the signal goes to zero, and this can be seen from the expression. And if you were to choose beta of 90 degrees, t1 equals t2, and the signal is equal to m0 over 2. So this is a simpler, more intuitive derivation of the signal, perhaps, than the matrix inversion. Now, let's compare the ellipsoid signal to the matrix derivation here. So in the matrix derivation, we use the flip angle alpha on resonance, and here we can replace this with beta, the effective flip angle. This is very powerful because it simplifies the calculation when off resonance is included. Additionally, in the ellipsoid derivation, we use the angle beta. So now we make some approximations. We're going to make the approximation that the exponentials 
are approximately 1 minus the exponent, and we're going to neglect higher order terms. We can substitute these in and divide out by tr over t1. And if we do this, we are left with this expression here. Next, we can apply these double angle identities here, or the double angle sine identity and the cosine, uh, corresponding cosine identity here. If we do this, we can simplify this a little bit further. Next, we can divide out the sine beta over 2 times cosine beta over 2 term. And this actually matches the ellipsoidal derivation. So I don't expect you to be able to do this in your head necessarily. So it takes a, a little bit of working through to convince yourself this is true if you're interested. But these do, in fact, match uh, perfectly. Now we will look at the transients in balanced SSFP. Using the same sequence, we can look at a slide we've seen previously where the magnetization approaches the same stable, unique, steady state. But notice that the transient paths to the steady state differ based on the initial state of the magnetization. So here we will try to analyze this and show how it can be analyzed quite easily. We saw in lecture three that we could use matrix solutions for transients. So if we apply a three by three matrix scheme, it looks something like this, where the magnetization on the subsequent excitation or repetition of the sequence is equal to A times the magnetization on the previous repetition plus B. And in the steady state, we can say that the magnetization does not change over one repetition. And if we subtract these two, we get this relatively simple expression here where the B term disappears. And the magnetization on any period minus the steady state is written as A times the previous difference between the magnetization and the steady state. We can analyze this using the eigenvector decomposition of the A matrix as shown on the left. The difference between the magnetization and the steady state can be written as the eigenvector matrix times the eigenvalue matrix raised to the k power times this term in yellow. Notice that the yellow term is V inverse times the initial difference between the magnetization and the steady state. So this M0 is the initial state, not the equilibrium state. If we recall that with the real valued three by three matrix system, at least one eigenvalue and eigenvector is real valued. The others are often oscillatory and will die out in the steady state. Note that in, in equation two here, the A matrix is mostly a rot rotation and B is quite small. So the steady state in fact lies almost along the real valued eigenvector. Now let's look at different transients. So if we rotate, the magnetization by plus minus 60 degrees, what happens is the magnetization approaches the steady state. You notice that there would be substantial signal oscillations here. Even if you remove the sign alternation of the signal here, the signal is going from a very small signal along the MZ axis to a larger signal where it's rotated about 60 degrees away from the axis. We can rotate the reference frame and we can see this if we remove the sign alternation, we still see the signal oscillation. What we can do here though, and we'll play this movie again, is we can actually decompose the magnetization into the component that's along the real valued eigenvector and the component that's orthogonal. And if we plot this, it's very interesting to see how the parallel component decays smoothly and exponentially, whereas the orthogonal component oscillates. And on the left, we look along the, I, the steady state, and we see that the orthogonal component is actually rotating around the steady state. 
Now this particular case is including a precession angle that is non-zero, so we've included some off-resonance, otherwise the oscillation might simply be back and forth rather than circular. So if we back this up, you see again the decompo decomposition here. So the steady state is shown by orange, and the orthogonal component is shown by yellow, and the final component is shown along the steady state. So if we watch that final, that component along the steady state just decays nice and smoothly. But the white arrow, which is the magnetization, is the sum of the component along the steady state and the orthogonal component. But the orthogonal component is dying out using a rotating, decaying exponential. So generally, for transients, there are two components. There's a smooth exponential component, and there's an oscillatory decaying exponential component. The smooth component is useful, but the oscillatory component can be problematic because this can cause artifacts in your image. Remember that, as we've just shown, the smooth transient is often along that steady state direction. So what we often want to do is manipulate the magnetization toward that steady state direction. So one approach to do this for balanced SSFP is called the half TR alpha over two setup. And what you do, as shown in the sequence at the bottom left, is the first RF pulse has half the amplitude and half the TR. So we apply this essentially at the point that would be midway between the RF pulses to place the magnetization um, rotated by alpha over two before we start the sequence. As you see in the top right, we've rotated this magnetization away. Now here we've rotated it minus alpha over two, and the next rotation will be alpha over two. So it doesn't really matter which way you do this. In the bottom right, we show the video that we showed previously, but what you'll see is in the top here when we play this, that the magnetization is already along its steady state condition, and it is simply decaying in length. And if we look at the video that we played in the previous slide, all we are left with is that component along the steady state, and this whole oscillatory component is what is suppressed here. Notice these are in two different rotating frames here, um, because the one in the bottom has, has got the, uh, the alternating flip angle removed uh, from the video. So a final statement is interesting to think about the direction of the balanced SSFP steady state. And to give you a little bit of intuition for this, what you can think of is you have an, a nutation and you have some precession. And that precession can either be force precession, uh, where you're simply rotating the, alternating the sign of the, 100, of the RF pulse, or it can be due to off resonance. So there's essentially a net axis of rotation or an effective B1 here, and the magnetization will align to this rotation axis. And this includes, as I said, any RF phase increment that is applied. So what you see here is looking back at the magnetization in the steady state here, that as you increase this theta angle here, the magnetization will be higher on this ellipse. And remember that the magnetization on resonance when you're alternating the flip angle, that has a, an effective theta of 180 degrees. So that gives you the highest point on the ellipse. So as the magnetization is precessing by 180 degrees, these cancel, and now your effective flip angle is along x, and the signal will die out, which corresponds to the signal nulls. Now we also can have a negative value of theta, and this just puts the steady state along the negative x as shown in the figure at right. So to summarize this lecture, we can do a matrix derivation of the balanced SSFP signal in 2D using an alternating reference frame to do this over one repetition. We can derive the signal geometrically, and this arises from the ellipsoidal model, and these two derivations will match. We can describe transients using a matrix exponential. The component of the initial state that is along the steady state will result in a smooth transient, and the perpendicular component to this will be oscillatory. 
And finally, the steady state can actually be considered as the effective rotation axis of the whole sequence. This lecture has provided some of the more challenging mathematics around the balanced SSFP sequence. It is not necessary to derive all of this yourself, but it is useful to know where this comes from. And you may wonder, how does this relate to other gradient echo sequences? And we will show this in the next two lectures.